Okay, Max, um, thanks a lot. I think that the first question I was going to ask you, you sort of touched on in, in your opening comments there, but um, you guys are recognized as one of the, the, the um, marquee examples of somebody that's used lean startup strategies um, so openly, you're faking your comments, but really, what are the key things that you guys did that are different than either the startups that you worked at in the past or founded, and what you see a lot of other startups doing? Um, so, I, I mean, for me, it's all about internalizing two lessons uh, about a startup. And one is that it's going to take a long time. And two is that you're almost definitely wrong. And if you approach the problem believing those two things, you make fundamentally different choices. So, you know, if you get together in a room and you think to yourself, well, what's the, what's the product that, that we should be building? And you are very sure of yourself, then you're going to go and build that product. And it's probably going to take six, nine months, and then you're going to come out with it, and you're probably going to be wrong. If you assume I'm probably wrong, and if I spend nine months doing this in a vacuum, I'm going to build the wrong thing, then you spend more time up front trying to figure out what you should be building in the first place. And part of that is faking things, part of it is minimum viable product, part of it is doing you know, more user research, qualitative and quantitative, part of it is learning more from what other people did, but all of that relates to the same idea, which is I'm probably wrong, how do I offset that? And if you've internalized that it takes a long time, then you're less frustrated to spend six months figuring out what you should do, or three months figuring out your name, because you're less antsy to just jump into it. Max, when I heard your presentation, one of the things that was very helpful for me is I was going through, you know, running down a couple of dead ends, and I found that it was taking me uh, a long time. Can you give me a sense of the, the time it took you where you just tried things? And you laid out a slide during your presentation, talked how long you tested things, how long you, it took you to figure out which product to go. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so for us, it was essentially uh, half a year on what I call product conception. And that was picking a problem, prototyping in serial, and basically abandoning ideas. And, uh, and that was not coincidental. We forced ourselves to take six months to conceive of a product. And if we'd allowed ourselves to do it in a week, we would have conceived of the product in a week and moved on to the next phase. But we actually forced ourselves to. It's like before you get married saying, I'm only going to get married to someone if I date them for at least a year. Well, it's not surprising that you would, you know, end up not marrying people that you would marry if you allowed yourself to get married after a week. So the first phase is the kind of conception phase, and I'd say you want to spend a half year on that, at least, and actually force yourself. And then we spend a year on what I call implementation. And this was, once we decided what to build, basically building refinements of that. Now, for us, we were still doing Wizard of Oz testing where we where it wasn't an end-to-end -end automated system, but we kind of knew what we were doing. And while we were doing that, we were recruiting the core team and raising seed financing. And mind you, we raised our Series A before we built an end-to-end -end product, but there was enough there that we could kind of show this is what we're going to do and the, and the VC was going to take the leap that we would actually be able to automate that uh, and scale it. And then we spent kind of a year on refinement, which is, you know, essentially building the team. We tripled the team over that period. It's starting to get really into the nitty gritty of positioning and features. And it's taking the, the space that you've defined and the product that you've defined and really owning it in terms of press and thought leadership and, and you know, having people at least in the little tech bubble think of you in the same sentence when they think of your larger space or your larger problem. So what was a longer length of time from uh, the day you guys said, let's start a company until you found the MVP, or the length of time between MVP and exit? Uh, it was uh, longer to what I'd say was the MVP. Uh, you know, it was basically a year and a half getting to there, and then it was only a year uh, at most until exit. And, and exit uh, ended up being sooner than we thought. And of course, over most 
corporate cycles, if you're successful, if you build a public company, you're going to spend a lot more time refining it than figuring out what you should be doing in the first place and with whom. But in any event, I think people tend to underinvest in that early period. So you're, you're always good to put the brakes on and have it take longer. I, mean, I was just saying to someone, a good idea will be a good idea 18 months later. It won't be a good idea five years later, but it will be a good idea 18 months later. I hope somebody tweets that. That's an awesome quote. So um, you were the CEO. What was it like for you in the trenches of this process? I mean, I'm sure people came into uh, into the company with different ideas of how long this was going to take. I mean, can you give us some more stories. I mean, was it was it frustrating at times? So I mean, there is nothing more frustrating than uh, deciding you're an entrepreneur, quitting your job, doing your startup, and then when people ask you what you're doing. You're, you're telling them kind of nonsense because you're working on whatever prototype you worked on that week and you have no name for your product and you've kind of forced yourself to tread water for that early period and actually not hire engineers until you have a clearer sense of what direction you're going in. Um, that's a very frustrating period. Uh, but, the, but the benefits later on when you can kind of feel more sure are tremendous. Uh, that's kind of one side. Another side is we, we hired the type of people and created the type of process that would let us uh, learn. And that meant making decisions more collaboratively. It meant you know, constantly user testing, bringing people in every single week, a half dozen to a dozen, to go through interviews and work on mock flows and, and try things out. And you move really slowly. And, you know, it's frustrating having so many cooks in the kitchen. But the result was when we got good at that process a year later, and when we've done enough of these user tests every single week that we got good at user testing, it's a lot less stressful to run the company. Because there's some basis in why you're making decisions other than, you know, your, your hunch that day. Okay, and uh, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience here since we got a few minutes left and I've got a, a final uh, one final question for you. So anybody questions for Max real quick? Okay, Pierre. How much did you spend in the first six months? I mean how much money? Yes. Uh, it was entirely bootstrapped. I mean we spent probably twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. I mean none of us Founders were earning money. We weren't coding. We had some people we hired relatively inexpensively to put things together. But it wasn't until we kind of picked the product that we raised seed financing. I was wondering if you could speak more about the testing process. I was wondering if you could speak more about the testing process. Um, so this is, this is on user tests. Yeah. So, uh, there's, there's kind of two types of, or let me put it this way. I think there's three types of development. There's hunch driven development where you basically build what you think you should be building. And that involves a lot of whiteboards and a lot of smart people and a lot of late night brainstorms. And it tends to be pretty wrong. Then there's, qualitative user-driven development, where essentially you are bringing people in and you're doing some type of study. It's not statistically relevant. You're basically asking people what they think about this, what they think about that. And there's an entire methodology here and how not to ask leading questions. And you can be very, very rigorous and do these kinds of things where you follow people around throughout their day and see what they're doing. We chose to be very unrigorous, but to do a lot of them. So we were doing like, you know, half a dozen to a dozen people coming in for 30 minute sessions and maybe we show them, you know, the next version of the site and ask them to accomplish tasks. Maybe we'd show them a landing page and say, how would you describe this to your friend? Uh, maybe we'd ask them, you know, how do you make XYZ decision? What about this? What about that? And then the third type of product driven design, or Third type of uh, design process is quantitative design, where you run A B tests in very large numbers and you tap into 
you know, some existing ad network or AdWords to, to try out, is it A or B? Um, for some products, that's easier to do early stage than in others. When I look at a product like Google Search, all of their design process is quantitative user-driven design. Hello. Um, when you mentioned the six months of conceptualizing and then the one year of implementing, during the, that conceptualizing, is this what you mean? You're also getting user feedback, you're, you're having validated loops. Is that in your conceptualizing period? Is that what you meant? Uh, yeah, we're doing that. What we're also doing is uh, literally building prototypes about one a month, sending them out to friends and friends of friends as if this was a product we just discovered and seeing, you know, did anyone click on the email? Did anyone go through and sign up? Did anyone actually use it? If they used it, did anyone use it the week after? And when your answer is, you know, 0% to all of those, it tends to tell you that even though you love this idea and you think it's going to change the world, it, it might not be worth pursuing. Max, uh, thank you so much for your time. Let's give Max a round of applause here. So Max, as a final question, um, we're going to be, uh, in appreciation for your time, we would like to shamelessly promote uh, something of yours. So if we can ask you to tweet something, and I'm going to ask everybody to retweet it. Um, if there's something you want to get out as a promotional, we're, we're more than happy to do that for you. Appreciate for appreciation for you spending your time with us here in DC. So we'll be looking. Oh, I'm going to have to think of something good now. <laughs> All right. Main start at DC hashtag. We'll find it. All right. Thanks a lot, Max. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, really, thanks. Just once again, emphasize thank you, Sean and Sean, for presenting. It's really tough to get up here and have your heart in your sleeve like that and talk about all the mistakes you've made. And uh, and it lets me feel like I'm not alone when I hear how hard this is for people who are trying to do it and guys that have been successful at it. So, thanks everybody for coming. The best part of the event is coming up. Um, it's when we all go to dusk and have a have a beer and get to chat about uh, what we're working on. So, hope you can uh, hope you can stay. We do have to exit the room right away, so I'm going to have to ask everyone to sort of clean up and pick up your stuff and move out of here and take the conversation down the street. I'm going to lead the Mary Man procession down to M Street where Dusk is in the West. End. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you.